good afternoon. Uh, just a few things at the top and then happy to dive in and take your questions. So U.S. European Command announced yesterday that the USS WASP entered the Mediterranean Sea June 26th on a scheduled deployment to the U.S. Naval Forces Europe-Africa area of operations. The ship will support U.S. Ally, US allied and partner interests in the region, including in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea, to continue promoting regional stability and deterring aggression. The USS Wasp and the embarked 24th Marine Expeditionary Unit will be joined by the USS Oak Hill, which is currently in the Mediterranean Sea, and the USS New York, which is currently operating in the Atlantic Ocean. Together, this Navy and Marine Corps capability constitutes the WASP amphibious ready group that deployed from the East Coast on June 1st. The presence of an integrated ARGMU provides flexibility and enhanced capability to NAVUR and NAVAF and U.S. Sixth Fleet. You can see UCOM's full statement on their UCOM website. And now switching to a few operational updates on the temporary pier or the joint logistics over the shore capability that is being used to surge humanitarian assistance into Gaza. In the past seven days, U.S. Central Command delivered more than 4,500 metric tons or 10 million pounds of aid to the marshalling yard in Gaza, which works out to approximately 1.5 million pounds per day. For historical context, following the devastating tsunami in 2011, DOD delivered about 3 million pounds of aid to Japan over approximately two months. So just again, for context, in the last week, the temporary pier alone delivered tri almost tripled that volume. Additionally, the pier provided the second highest volume of aid from any entry point into Gaza this past week. In total, since May 17th, Central Command has assisted in the delivery of more than 8,831 metric tons, or approximately 19.4 million pounds of humanitarian aid to the shore for onward distribution by humanitarian organizations. Now, due to high sea states expected this weekend, Central Command has removed the temporary pier from its anchored position in Gaza and will tow it back to Ashdod, Israel. As always, the safety of our service members is a top priority, and temporarily relocating the pier will prevent potential structural damage that could be caused by the heightened sea state. U.S. Central Command will continue to provide updates on the status of the temporary pier, as will we from this podium. And finally, but last but not least, I want to acknowledge CBS correspondent David Martin as he wraps up his time covering the Pentagon. Later this summer, David will be stepping away from the daily Pentagon beat after having covered the Department of Defense for more than four decades and across seven administrations. The good thing is that we'll continue to hear from David as he continues his long-form storytelling for CBS News broadcasts. And I just want to say that you are one of the first people that I speak to almost <laughs> on a regular basis in the morning. So I will I will certainly miss seeing you in the building, but I hope those calls continue as well. Um, so on behalf of OSD Public Affairs, I just wanted to take this opportunity to congratulate you, David, congratulate your family, wish you the best in your next chapter. And with that, why don't you start us off if you have a question? Well, there are reports that <clears throat> that peer once it gets towed into Ashdod, it's not, Ashdod is not going to go back uh, because of the backlog in, uh, in shipments. Is that uh, correct? Uh, I wouldn't say that's correct in terms of the backlog of shipments. Um, there, is a, there is a need um, for more aid. I think what you're referring to is in Cyprus. We do need more aid to come into Cyprus. Um, we are pretty close to full on the marshalling yard in terms of how much aid is there. Um, as I mentioned in, in, at the top, this pier has provided um, you know, the second amount, most volume of aid uh, over you know, all the other crossings in Gaza. So we've certainly seen its capability. We've seen the importance of what it can do. Um, as high sea states are impacting the operability of the pier, that's why it's being removed. Um, when the commander decides that it is the right time to reinstall that pier, we'll keep you updated on that. So it may not go back? As of right now, the intention is to continue to get aid into Gaza by any means necessary. That includes the pier, uh, airdrops, and of course, as we've always said with the pier, it is meant to be temporary. Um, it is not the long-term solution or solve for land routes. Um, we know that's the most effective way in, but uh, that's really a decision that the commander will make as, as we continue to evaluate the high sea states. But I don't have a date of when the, the pier would be reinstalled. 
You don't have a date? I don't right now. As we'll, The commander will continue to assess the sea states over the weekend. Um, that could lead into next week. So we're going to continue to monitor the environmental and weather factors. And once we have a better update, we'll, we'll certainly provide that. So on a, uh, a separate subject, the, uh, <coughs> the uh, disintegration of this uh, yeah. Russian satellite, is there any indication that that uh, satellite came apart as a result of some kind of Russian anti-satellite test? As of right now, we're still evaluating why this um, satellite came apart. Uh, satellite breakups can result from a variety of different cases, but right now we just don't have um, an assessment of what broke this one apart, uh, which I believe happened on uh, June 26th. Okay, Tara? Thanks, Sabrina. Um, back to the pier, the marshalling yard is almost full and it doesn't seem like any delivery trucks are going to take that aid. So would uh, putting the pier back in place be contingent upon there actually being room to put more aid? Because how could you move aid if you don't have anywhere to put it? Yes, I mean, uh, of course. Um, if there's not enough room on the marshalling yard, then uh, it doesn't make sense to put our men and women um, out there when there's nothing to move. Um, there is still room. I don't want to give the impression that um, it's at capacity. It is certainly full. Um, but we do need to see that marshalling yard open up um, to allow for aid groups to continue that distribution so that we can get more aid in um, as we get it from Cyprus. So is there any Anything that the U.S. can do to help get that aid moving out of the marshalling yard? So that's something that we've we've been having ongoing conversations with um, the WFP, and by we, I, I should say the larger, uh, broader we. It's an interagency effort that's really being spearheaded by USAID. Um, so for more um, updates on those conversations, I'd refer you to them to speak to how those conversations are going with WFP. But we all know that this is a priority. We want to see distribution. Um, pick back up. We want to see aid delivered to the people that need it most. Um, we certainly know and understand and are monitoring the dire humanitarian situation on the ground. So we certainly want to see that distribution back up. The coordination cell that the U.S. has a role in to help yeah. with the convoys. Um, what What's going on there as far as uh, how U.S. officials, U.S. military officials are working with IDF to maybe try and streamline communications between the IDF and the aid groups? Well, that's part of what the deconfliction cells do. Um, both uh, we have one in Cyprus and one in Israel. They are there to help with the distribution of aid. Um, it's more how groups, NGOs, WFP also plugs into that. Um, I don't want to speak on behalf of, of those groups and, and USAID in particular, but right now there is good communication between you know, our military personnel in those deconfliction cells and uh, the IDF. Phil. Hey, um, so just to clarify really quick, and then I have a question. Sure. So is the marshalling area full or, or not? I wouldn't say it's at capacity. Um, there's still some room there, but it's, it's, it's I would say, uh, majority is pretty full right now. Yeah. Oh, and then secondly, uh, in yesterday's uh, debate, uh, President Biden said he was the only president of the century that didn't have any troops dying uh, anywhere in the world. And I'm just wondering, you know, how, how, how the Pentagon uh, whether the Pentagon stands by those remarks, given that three U.S. service members died in Jordan this year, and then, of course, that's not even counting Abbey Gate. And yeah. just wondering what the Pentagon's comment is on that. Sure. No, and thank you for the question. Um, you know, for more on the president's comments and and on the debate itself, I, I'd refer you to the White House. But um, in terms of, uh, you know, our service members who have been killed in um, some of these tragic events around the world, um, I've. You know, and you've seen the president call these families to express condolences. Um, this is someone that has um, intimately experienced, um, you know, the commitment and dedication of of what our military does, and you know, he has his own personal experience with that. Um, so, uh, you know, I've seen him express great compassion and and um, condolences to families who are who have been impacted, and that's something that he's not only done as president, but of course as vice president as well. Um, but for more on those comments, I just, I'd refer you to the White House on that. Is the secretary reaching out to any families to provide any additional context to the president's remarks? I don't have any calls to read out. Warren. Just, just to be clear, was the president's statement incorrect? I, again, just not trying to get in, involved in uh, uh, campaign events or really go further on comments on the debate. If the president had more context, I'd refer you to the White House to speak to his comments. Um, I think you and others have reported on some of the um, 
tragic light losses of life that we have seen from service members, whether it be as Phil referenced in Jordan um, or in other places around the world. And you've seen this president express his deepest condolences to those families as well. So I, I would refer you to the White House for, for more. Beating around the bush here. Uh, this is a question to the Pentagon. Do sure. you? Has President Biden had service members die anywhere in the world during his time in office? We, as you have reported on, we have certainly had service members um, pass uh, during our during this administration, um, and you've seen not just the secretary but the president himself also uh, weigh in and comment and offer condolences, whether it's calling the families or through statements. Um, but I just don't have more to offer in terms of the debate itself. And then one question on the pier. Six weeks ago today, the pier yeah. began operating, if my, if my math is right. And it's been down for roughly two and a half weeks. Has the pier lived up to its expectations? I would say it certainly has, Oren. Um, I mean, just it, 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 it might have been operating for, you know, six weeks and during that time yes we have had periods of time where we've had to pull it offline because of weather uh we've had periods of time where we, we've had to do repairs uh, but as i mentioned in my topper um since may 17th we've had over 19 million pounds of aid delivered to the shore in gaza that is i'd say a great success um and you have to remember that at the beginning of uh this year in uh, the State of the Union, the president directed this maritime corridor be established. And I think it has been successful because at the end of the day, not enough aid is getting into the people of Gaza. This is meant to be an additive measure. This is not meant to be the only um, route where aid can get in. And we've been able to deliver 19 million pounds. And yes, there is still aid that is sitting in that marshalling area awaiting further distribution. We're working with groups to, to make sure that happens. But um, I would say that our men and women in uniform have done really heroic work to get that aid to the people that need it most. Carla. I, I just have a follow up. Sure. But, um, you talked about how it was a success, mm -hmm. but you've also said that those, what, 19 million pounds, mm -hmm. they haven't reached the people. So how is that defined as success? Well, not all of them, but you have to remember, Carla, that uh, in terms of the distribution efforts, that is not what the United States or United States military is doing. The president at the outset said there will be no boots on the ground in Gaza. So the distribution efforts are being done by WFP and, and the UN. Um, these groups are put a, put a pause in place. They're doing an assessment um, so that they can continue their own operations. 19 million pounds is still not nothing. And I think we have to commend uh, the donations, whether it be from countries around the world, from other aid groups that went to site, that got aid to Cyprus, that has moved to the pier or to the floating pier and then onto the temporary pier into the marshalling area. Um, that is still aid that is going to save lives. Um, and I think it, our, our central command and, and um, you know, UCOM forces should be commended for their, their work on that. And the ships that are in the Mediterranean, um, mm -hmm. what would you define as their purpose? Are, are they capable of evacuating people should war break out in between Israel's north and uh, Hezbollah? Yeah, so I've seen a lot of reporting on, you know, evacuation efforts that could happen. I think it's important to remember that uh, a capability like the ARGMU can provide and do many other things. Um, one being a military assisted departure, but that is not their only capability. Uh, they are there in the region to um, ensure regional stability, to deter aggression. And I think you have to remember, as you reported early on, um, you'll remember the Ford moved into the Eastern Med. Uh, you know, I think it was um, dedicated October 8th that started moving towards the Eastern Med. We also had the 26 MU in the, in the Eastern Med and all around um, that uh, it made its way through the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden. Um, and we didn't have to do a military assisted departure during that time. So these are capabilities, these are um, deployments that are pre-scheduled and they are there in case you know there is a, something that is needed for them. But right now they are there to ensure stability and deter. Constantine. Thanks, Sabrina. Um, <clears throat> so you just uh, said today, and I, I think folks from the podium have said repeatedly that the, the Gaza Pier was meant to always be additive, that uh -huh. it's <clears throat> and that the land routes are supposed to be the most efficient way to get aid in. But you know, you're saying that the pier has, I guess, inadvertently become the second most uh, productive entry point for mm -hmm. aid. I mean, does the Pentagon have any thoughts on how that came to be? that this additive measure has become one of the most 
uh, effective ways to get aid into into the region? I think it shows the capability of our military and being able to be incredibly efficient and also the interagency being able to work to solicit donations to get into Cyprus and then move that through the temporary pier. And I think at the end of the day, this was a capability that um, whether it be nations around the world, NGOs, other groups that saw this is another method to get aid in to people that need it most and they wanted to partner with the United States. Um, I can't speak to you know every nation that's donated, but it's certainly uh, meant to be additive. It's meant to be temporary. We continue to urge for those land routes to be opened. Um, that is the most effective way to get aid in. Right, and so I mean, I guess my question, my follow up to that would be, you know, do, does the Pentagon not see this as a failure of getting the land routes open? That the pier is the most effective way to get aid in right now, or one of the most? The, the land routes not being open is certainly something that we're concerned about, and we want to see more trucks getting in every single day. And that is something that um, I've heard the secretary continue to emphasize with Minister Gallant, and not just from this building, across the interagency. So that is something that we continue to um, urge the Israelis to open up those crossing. That is the best way in, and we're going to continue to do that. In the meantime, while that's not, while that's not you know, flowing the way it should. This is an additive measure that is going to help people and that has helped people. Uh, moving 19 million pounds of aid, um, I think is not nothing. I think that, you know, our, our forces that are doing that hard work out there, um, you know, they're, they're putting their sweat and tears into this every single day. Um, and that is aid that's going to get to the people that need it most eventually. Uh, Lara. Thank you. How much aid has actually gotten into Gaza, into for to the people of Gaza? To yeah. Gaza, that would be something that I would let USAID and uh, World Food Program speak to because the um, once it goes off from the marshalling area, it goes into dis different distribution centers. So from there, that's really uh, more for WFP and the UN to speak to and USAID. Okay. Mm -hmm. And is can you tell me is the military preparing for an evacuation of American citizens or U.S. personnel from Lebanon? No. Yes. Uh, just to follow up on the pier. Sure. Um, so it seems like the U.S. military is doing a ton of work, and it's not confirmed if this has gotten to people who need it or not. Is that frustrating? No. I mean, we understand the concerns that groups like WFP um, have while operating within Gaza. Um, we certainly understand their concerns, and, and they're really theirs to speak to. Um, our priority is making sure that we are getting aid across to that pier. So when distribution starts back up, um, it's there, it's ready, um, and it can be it can go you know far and wide. And to, to Lara's question, it goes into these distribution centers where then it is further distributed. Um, so I'd let you know WFP and the, and the really the UN speak to those efforts. But no, I don't consider this a failure. This was always meant to be an additive measure. This was always meant to be a way to help supplement aid getting in, um, it is not the most effective way. It is really those land routes. Um, on a separate sure. topic, uh, the South by Southwest yeah. Festival in Austin, Texas, has barred the U.S. military from sponsoring next year's festival um, due to the U.S. military's support of Israel. Um, does the Pentagon disagree or agree with that decision? Any comment? I don't really have a comment to offer. It's um, up to private companies, private organizations to make their own decisions. Um, we are certainly, you know, working to get aid into Gaza to the Palestinian people that meet uh, that need it most that's our priority when it comes to humanitarian aid and we're focused on that uh, I'm gonna keep going around here Nancy and then I'll go to you um, I just had a quick follow-up sure. to Phil's question has the secretary made any calls um, to allies related to, to the debate um, either reassuring allies or received any calls from allies who expressed any concerns related to the debate I'm not aware of any calls Thank yeah. you. Yes. Thank you, Sabrina. Um, I have uh, two questions. First one, regarding to the escalation of the Lebanon uh, border, mm -hmm. um, have you seen any progress uh, regarding to the diplomatic solution that uh, Secretary Austin has been uh, announced during his meeting with uh, the Israeli counterpart part, uh, Gallant? And uh, do you still believe that a diplomatic solution is still possible? We still believe a diplomatic solution is possible and the best way to avoid a wider regional war in the north. Um, I would refer you to actually what the secretary said in his opening comments, um, that we don't want to see a wider regional war. We want to see a de-escalation of tensions. And part of the reason why uh, you're seeing the WASP uh, move into the UCOM AOR is to deter aggression, to de-escalate tensions in the region. Um, so we certainly believe that through diplomatic channels, that is the best way of resolving any conflict. 
And my uh, second sure. question um, regarding to other topic uh, with uh, the Russia Defense Minister um, ordered today his officials to prepare a response to U.S. drone flights over the Black Sea. Uh, how much that could escalate the tensions and does the DOD prepare for any scenario about that? Yeah, I, I've seen some of that reporting in those comments. I don't I don't really have a comment to offer uh, for you on that. Um, you know, we continue to fly, fly sail and operate um, in international waters and international spaces um, where the laws allow. Um, I just don't have anything more to add at this time. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, I'm just trying to understand in terms of the communications, obviously military, to military the uh, Israel and the US have a great conflicting relationship. Is the Pentagon not able to assist USAID in that deconfliction to allow some of this aid off the marshalling area and to the people? Could you just um, help elaborate more on like the deconfliction between what you're yeah. asking on USAID? There's no role for DOD in assisting with the deconfliction between USAID and WFP and, and Israel because that's part I of see. the concern from WFP. So U USAID has the relationships with the NGOs. That is, you know, I don't want to speak on behalf of USAID, but that is their, their role. They are the coordinating humanitarian organization, not just for what's happening in Gaza, but, you know, countries all around the world. Um, so they have that relationship and they're really plugged in with the UN. Um, DOD's mission is the maritime corridor. We all fit together in different pieces, but you have to remember that USAID is the lead when it comes to working with um, humanitarian organizations. Um, DOD's role when it comes to the deconfliction is is really the peer operations itself. Um, we have a we we have set up deconfliction cells that I think um, certainly model a, a good way forward on on you know how to operate within Gaza. Um, but of course, the WFP has its own you know requests concerns, um, and that's something that they are working through. And I just wouldn't go want to go beyond that. Yeah, go ahead, Leah. Uh, two questions. Thank you. One, um, there is a. Uh, according to reports and also in Pakistan, also there is a resolution on the Capitol Hill against Pakistan. Pakistan is still, still like in the past, have been supporting Iran on their nuclear programs. Now we hear that Iran is uh, ready to uh, near as far as their nuclear program is concerned. So where do we stand as far as uh, U.S. is supporting Pakistan or Pakistan wants U.S. support, but at the same time they are... Uh, helping Iran and others in their nuclear. Uh. I, I don't have much more to provide than what General Ryder provided, uh, I think, on Tuesday was that, you know, we work with Pakistan on a range of different issues, have, uh, you know, deep military cooperation, but I don't have more to offer on, you know, any nuclear assistance or, or programs. Um, I'm sorry, I should have gone to the phones and then I'm happy to come back in the room for any additional questions. Uh, Jared Zuba, I'll monitor. Hi, Sabrina. I just wanted to check. Um, uh, I think there's been some reporting that uh, Israeli Defense Minister Gallant may have pitched uh, perhaps a limited, tailored Israeli campaign in southern Lebanon uh, against Hezbollah. Is there any room for that uh, in the discussions uh, or in the from the perspective of Washington? Is the, is the United States uh, willing to see uh, a, a limited Israeli uh, operations in southern Lebanon to secure their border? Thanks, Jared. I just haven't seen that um, or those comments, so I'm, I'm a little... Uh... Uh, I just don't want to comment on something that I haven't seen. Uh, I think bottom line is we don't want to see an expanded uh, front open on the northern border between Israel and Lebanon. Um, that's something that I direct you to directly what the secretary said earlier this week when he had his bilat with Minister Gallant. Uh, we are concerned about tensions continuing to rise there. We want to see a de-escalation of those tensions. And we believe that the best way forward is through um, diplomatic channels to resolve that um, to, to, to avoid any further conflict. Um, I'll take one more from the phone. Uh, JJ Green, WTOP. Thank you, Sabrina, for taking this. Um, we heard, heard and have been reporting recently that the president is considering allowing Pentagon contractors to deploy to Ukraine. Is that a done deal? Where does that stand? And what are the limits uh, on what they would do if and when they are deployed? 
Thanks, JJ, for the question. So uh, we have not made any decisions when it comes to uh, U.S. contractors. I've seen some of the reporting out there. Um, the president, of course, has been absolutely firm that there will be no uh, U.S. troops on the ground in Ukraine. Um, but I'm just not going to comment any further on internal discussions um, or reports over something that um, may or may not even be under consideration. So thanks for the question, JJ. Happy to come back in the room if there's any additional. I think, uh, Louis. Yeah. yeah, this is a, a little different. Uh, <laughs> Great. <laughs> yes, um, so President Putin has said that uh, Russia will once again resume production of short-range and medium-range uh, nuclear-capable missiles, uh, which had been a unilateral mor moratorium until, in their words, the United States deployed these types of weapons. Mm -hmm. um, I guess they're, he's citing reports that some weapons, similar weapons have been sent to Denmark and to the Philippines for exercises. Um, what is your comment on... Number one, can you confirm those deployments? Number two, can you say that yes? Um, well, I mean, what kind of an impact this would have on the US? So, uh, because I haven't seen these comments, and I'm sorry, I just I haven't I haven't seen this, so I, I don't want to comment on something that I haven't seen. I can't confirm the deployments of those weapons. I'm happy to look into this for you, though. And can I follow up on all these questions about uh, J. Lots and viability? Sure. Um, is this um, a decision that the United States? government would make as a whole, in other words, since you've been talking about how USAID is the lead humanitarian mm -hmm. organization, would they, be the, would they, along with you in support of them, be the ones that makes this decision or recommendation to continue uh, with the peer should yeah. the um, staging area continue to fill up? Yeah, this is an interagency effort. Uh, the peer wouldn't be successful without the efforts of USAID, uh, with State Department, with others, um, including the WFP other countries, NGOs. So absolutely, any decisions when it comes to the peer, um, of course, it's an interagency conversation that happens. Um, the actual operations logistics of the peers, for example, when to remove it for high sea states, that's a decision that the commander makes. But of course, like the viability, um, aid being able to flow off of it, we wouldn't have been able to do what we were able to do without the support of USAID. Um, so of course, this is an interagency effort. Can you comment on the, uh, yesterday, the inspectors general from USAID and um, the Pentagon launching reviews of JLOTS and the humanitarian aid delivery system? Mm -hmm. We certainly, uh, I, I mean, I can't comment on the specifics because it's an on, you know, the IG has launched its investigation. We're aware that it has launched its, an, an investigation um, or review into the peer. Um, you know, we certainly welcome that, not opposed to any anyone looking into our efforts, because I think we do have a lot of successes to speak to, um, not to mention the fact that I've already mentioned this, but I will mention it again, of getting over 19 million pounds, uh, you know, to the marshalling area um, since May 17th. So I'm um, aware of it, but I just don't have more to add on that. Uh, we'll, go to, we'll go to Phil, then you in the back, and then we'll close out. Yeah. Just a quick clarification. Sure. Uh, you'd said earlier to Laura that um, the U.S. was not preparing uh, any uh, right. uh, non-combatant evacuation from Lebanon. Um, but does that include like just general planning that the Pentagon would do in the event of any hostilities anywhere? Or are you talking about just the actual the movement of, of ships to carry one out? I'm just trying to be clear about sure. what you're talking about, what you're not talking about. So the purpose of the, the, the WASP um, are moving into towards the Eastern Mediterranean is not, its purpose is to not, is not to conduct um, a type of NEO or military assisted departure. Um, it is there to ensure regional stability and to deter aggression. It has many other capabilities. One being if there was a need for any type of departure, um, it can be there to assist in that. But as you know, it has a range of capabilities and a, and a range of different mission sets it can accomplish. Um, we are of course a planning organization. So we all are always thinking through those plans, but the purpose of moving um, the WASP into that into this AOR, one, I will also admit, you know reiterate, it was a scheduled deployment, um, and two, it's not its purpose is again just to ensure regional stability and deter aggression. Yes, last question. Thanks, Dan. Um, this is kind of a broad question, but I wanted to ask kind of in FY2025, how is the secretary going to continue to advance convergence and interop interoperability in terms of technologies and capabilities in the Indo-Pacific region. I don't know if there's anything you can highlight about what he's planning. Well, I I mean, 
I, I think, as you know, the Indo-Pacific uh, region and, and the NDS, which is our North Star, um, is always top of mind for the secretary. And um, he just concluded his 10th visit to the region. So I think that shows you the importance of our priority theater. Um, in terms of, you know, FY25, uh, I, I certainly wouldn't get ahead of the secretary, but I think the NDS certainly guides our priorities and our, and our principles here. Um, we are, of course, always monitoring what is happening in the, the, in the Indo-Pacific. You've seen under the secretary's leadership an expanded cooperation with the Philippines. You've seen a deepening of cooperation with India. Um, you know, our, our commitment to the Korean Peninsula is stronger than ever. Um, so I'll just leave it at that, but, you know, not getting ahead of, of the secretary, of course. Yeah, of course. All right, we'll wrap it there. Thanks, everyone.